I'm plugging in for now. And I'll, I'll mute it. And, oh, I can do that. <laughs> Let's try that again. So, um, welcome to the uh, Gov Zero Summit unconference um, yesterday. Uh, who was here yesterday? Oh, most of you. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, this year is slightly complicated. Well, it's the first time, but um, we have our conference kind of separate from the conference. Um, we usually do hackathons like, um, every two months. But uh, this time we want to try something different during on conference, so a lot more people uh, can have different topics to discuss over uh, today. And uh, so, um, uh, right. So I will explain what's happening today. Um, yesterday we had some people propose some sessions already, right? Like that. And you will find the paper here. 大家可以在这边找到这个点, uh, so uh, you will put, put in like whatever you want to discuss or what are you actively working on or you want to find people to collaborate and uh, post it somewhere here, maybe slightly according to the topic. And uh, after the keynote today, we will do an arrangement of rooms um, produced here. We will cluster together um, topic that's similar and um, so you will be like in the same room and try to talk to each other. So the tip for our conference is that it's not a session of presentation. It's like you try to make uh, facilitate a conversation. So a topic, and then you have some idea, and then you encourage other people to participate in this topic and um, maybe come up with something, right? So uh, we would encourage you to like at least uh, find at least one person that will be uh, doing the note taking during our conference session. So I think we already have a unconference uh, hack folder here, and uh, uh, it's the 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 hack pads are already there, so you can just um, idea pool. Tell me idea oh, pool. Right, idea pool. Right. So you can also like put discussion here and uh, related stuff here. Right. So we have like a few. Okay, so um, what else for logistics? Um, right, so we have actually five different uh, rooms. This one will be split into two uh, during, well, after the keynote. And then we have um, the launch, which is right outside. And we have another room uh, over here. And another room at 108, that's toward the uh, entrance and turn left. There should be signs everywhere. So um, once we arrange the uh, topics here, then uh, you should find the room that has a topic you're interested in. Um, so usually we also encourage people if if, if there uh, like not enough space, you can just create your own room like uh, outside on the grass or but it's raining today, so it's not working. So uh, but um, the lounge is quite quite large, so you can actually occupy a corner if that, there's nothing on the board left. So feel free to move around different uh, rooms or create your own and whatever. So basically the conference is a conference content created by people participating. Right, so, um, did I miss anything? No? Right, so, um, it will be my great honor to uh, introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Clay Shirky. Uh, who is a professor in NYU, is now uh, in, conveniently in Shanghai, so uh, very close by. And uh, um, I, don't really, I don't really need to introduce him much, uh, but if you haven't read his book, uh, it's uh, been selling outside, so uh, I guess we'll do a signing. Um, sure. Or lunch time or sure. whatever. Yeah. Appropriate for birthday presents, you get multiple cups. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks very much. Uh, thank you all. Um, I uh, talked to a bunch of people last night and this morning about yesterday, which sounded like an amazing day. I'm sorry to have missed it, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here now. Uh, I want to um, do an un-keynote in, in, uh, in, in the spirit of the conference. I want to talk about open-ended problems rather than here are some things we already know how to do. Uh, I want to talk in particular about the problems that both uh, political movements, uh, broadly participatory political movements, 
have with scale and the problems that people developing software tools for those groups also have with scale. I'm going to concentrate in particular on three problems. Problems of modularity, uh, social problems of bridging capital versus bonding capital, uh, and the famous one, consensus versus decisiveness as a way of, of running the group. Uh, so let me start with the basic observation, which I sketch out on the whiteboard also. Uh, politics in a participatory mode is the act of getting a group of people to come to an agreement. If two people have to agree, they have one agreement between them. If three people have to agree, they have to negotiate three agreements among the group. If four people have to agree, they have to negotiate six agreements between the pairs of people. If you've ever wondered why it seems twice as hard to get a group of four people to agree what movie to go see as a group of three people, the reason is that it is exactly mathematically twice as hard. There is twice as much negotiating to do in a group of four as a group of three. Five gets you to 10. 10 gets you to 45. You can see that little ball of string there. Um, the experience we had in high school that cliques are hard to join was actually true. It is energetically more difficult to join a group the larger it gets if the requirement for being part of the group is that everybody knows everybody. Because for any group of N members, every new member requires N new connections. Um, in the software world, the most famous observation made around this basic math came from Fred Brooks's book called The Mythical Man Month. And Brooks observed IBM managing software projects. IBM would regularly have projects go uh, beyond their projected ship date. I know that none of this has ever happened to anyone in this room, <laughs> but the ability of people at IBM to, to correctly estimate the ship date was weak. So IBM would add more programmers to the project, reasoning that that would speed things up. And what Brooks observed is that it always slowed things down. The formulation of what's come to be called Brooks's Law is adding more programmers to a late software project makes it later. The reason for this is that the communications overhead goes up by more than the advantage of the shared additional participants. This does not happen if you are digging ditches. If you are digging ditches and you double the number of people, you can dig twice as much ditch in one day. The more coordinated an effort has to be, the harder it is for the group to grow, and that problem at any, any significant scale at all becomes intractable. So uh, the way we put this around NYU is density defeats scale, and scale defeats density. You can't have a big group in which everyone knows everyone or everyone trusts everyone. For the same reason that you can't have six people over to dinner and say, that was great, that was a lot of fun, I want to do that again next week, but I want to have an intimate conversation with 60 people. It's not that you might not like those 60 people. It's not that those 60 people might not like each other. It's that you can't do it. Density defeats scale, scale defeats density. Even worse, that problem is true at all imagined densities. You can't have a large group where everyone knows everyone. So you might say, well, fine, we'll have half the people, everyone will know, everyone will know half the people in the room. So there will still be a group of some density. Even that level of density can't be supported at scale. At any non-zero cost for a link between two people. There is some moderately sized human group that destroys your ability to pay that cost. The basic math, Grimm, is that the groups get complex faster than they get large. And that in general, if you double the size of the group, you, you quadruple the communication complexity. If a group grows by a factor of 10, the communications complexity grows by a factor of 100 for all densities you might pick to try and support. This isn't sociology. This isn't politics. This is math. This is just how networks work. There's no getting out from under this. 
So this is not a problem in the sense that there are no solutions. This is a dilemma for which there are only various optimizations. So, first optimization. The obvious one in all, uh, in all groups is modularity. My friend David Eves, who's sitting in the front row and spoke yesterday, noted uh, years ago that open source software projects tend to go modular with a platform and a plugin architecture, not when the code base needs modularity, but when the developers do. When the developers are tired of everybody arguing with everybody or everybody being able to write to the kernel or whatever it is, that's the thing that forces the modularity. Large code bases might require modularity. Large developer groups always require modularity. One of the difficulties this poses for political movements is that the original excitement for many of these movements is a small group of people who got in a room and all felt the same way. And that that profound human connection is so good that there's a natural impulse to preserve it. But you can't preserve it at scale. And so it falls, and it is, it is a, particularly among participatory movements, it is a long-term long problem, widely replicated. How you get from a small group of people who can all just look each other in the eye and really without a lot of other coordination know what they should do next to a large group of people that encompasses an enormous range of strategies and tactics and skills and biases. Uh, there are different optimizations to that dilemma, but there's no getting out from under that dilemma. Yokai Bankler, years ago, in, in a piece that uh, is, I think, the most important thing ever written about social media, it's a piece called Kosa's Penguin, in which he lays out, essentially, the logic of uh, large participatory groups, uh, identifies three characteristics of these very large scale projects. He was principally looking at digital projects like Wikipedia, but the, the lessons I think are general. First, how small is the smallest unit of participation? Right? When you're moving from a small number of true believers to a much larger group that includes people from the general public just stopping in, how small is the smallest useful unit? And the smaller it is, the easier it is to recruit. Now, recruiting for scale isn't always what you want to do, but that is, for growth, one of the, one of the questions you have to face. How easy is it for people to find what their particular role is? How easy is it for someone to raise their hand and say, I can work on problem X? Uh, highly opaque or, uh, or complex, political organizations make it much harder for people to find a way in. Um, I had this experience, as I think many, many people did in various of these movements, um, with Zuccotti Park in New York, the Occupy Wall Street movement. In, uh, in 2011, I went down and I said, I'm going to observe. I didn't think of myself as having any common cause, but I'd heard that it was happening. Now, I would go down to Zuccotti Park and I will observe what was happening. Mentally, I had a blue helmet on. I was there with the UN. Uh, I wasn't taking sides. I just wanted to see what was going on. I got there. I saw the people around the outside with their political signs. I've seen lots of political signs before in the US. Nothing surprised me particularly, except the one sign that read, shit is fucked up and bullshit, which I thought, there, that's, that's the truest thing I've seen all day. But walking into the park and seeing people not protesting with signs in the classic American mode, but just talking to each other. By the time I got to the middle of the park and I saw the food tent, not the political signs, but the people just making sure that everyone was fed, I just walked up and said, how can I help? And I didn't do much with Occupy. I was, I was a fairly casual occupier. But every week I helped restock the food tent and the first aid tent. That was my little job. And I self-identify as an occupier because Occupy created a space for me to find a little job and do it. Every Monday morning, I'd go down with a bunch of coffee because everybody was wrecked from the weekend, and then help the food and first aid. And that was it. I, it was no more than that, but it was enough. Those little units, right? rather than amping everyone up to enormous contribution, finding those little units. And finally, how easy is it to integrate uh, 
integrate the contributions into a whole. This is true both of politics and of software designed to support politics, which is can people make small contributions that can be easily integrated into the whole? Um, one of the extraordinary things that's going on in the software world that I hope jumps species into politics is better styles of arguing and integration. What's that? Oh, is this not? Uh, okay, good. Sorry. Uh, if you look at the way people are arguing on GitHub, uh, that is a profound model of arguing that has that that says essentially show me what it is you would change and then let someone else decide whether to integrate it. Uh, but figuring out modularity is a forced move for any political movement that aims to be large. You can't be big and non-modular. So figuring out issues of contribution, volunteerism, and integration becomes something that every movement has to take take on in one way or another. It is an interesting problem to figure out what the different models are. The second, the second issue that these, that that political movements in particular have to have to deal with is the question of bridging capital versus bonding capital, uh, and and bridging social capital versus bonding social capital. The easiest way to understand the difference between bonding and bridging capital is this. Uh, Think of the list of people who would loan you $100 without asking why or when they would get it paid back. You say, I need $100, and they say, here you go. Right? If, and that, if you're increasing bonding capital, you're trying to increase essentially the amount that those people would trust you, the amount that they would be willing to lend you, or the freedom with which they would let them, you pay them back. Bonding capital is a way of deepening trust relationships among people who already trust each other. Bridging capital is a way of increasing the number of people who would say yes when you asked, which is to say bridging capital is about getting to know new people in a relatively lightweight way. So bridging capital versus bonding capital matters because the small group that you fall in love with when you are all setting out to do something together is made of pure bonding capital. It is that deep emotional connection among all of the participants. If you look at the drawing there with 10 people and 45 connections, the ball is string. Another way to connect 10 people is to have two tight groups of five and one link between them. Much, much simpler. It means the communications between the two groups Goes between, uh, goes between the groups with people whose job is just to open the communications interface. This creates all kinds of problems that everyone recognizes, right? There's a risk of hierarchy, there's a risk of the people in control of information strangling it and so forth. But the counter risk, which I think very often participatory movements don't take enough account of, is that you devolve into the kind of ball of wax that has everyone process blocking every possible next move. So in, uh, in what was called inner Occupy after the Occupy movement, or during and after the Occupy movement, when there were multiple encampments all over the world, we realized that there was never going to be a general, a global general assembly. And one of the things we talked about in the inner Occupy group was how can we strengthen the ties between the occupations without having that global group. And our goal was, and this is when the cops in the US started rolling up the camps, so we did not get to see this at scale. But our goal was that every occupation should have two groups of two people, each of whom knows two people in two other occupations, which meant that that was the minimum robust connection. If any one of those links had been broken, no, no link between occupations would have been severed. If any one of those people had left, no link would be severed. It gives you a little bit of time to heal. But it is the least dense possible network for information flow. That is bridging capital. That says we don't all need to agree. We don't all need to come to consensus. We don't, in fact, even all need to understand everything that the other group is doing. We do need to communicate. We do need to keep information flow. And figuring out how to build a political movement that moves from bonding capital in the beginning to bridging capital later is a huge 
design challenge. Anyone who's ever been in a small organization that has grown, whether it's a startup or a volunteer organization, will have seen this. When there's a dozen people in the room and you come in and you ask who everyone is, the answer you get will always be, that's Diane, and that's Seth, and that's Sue, and that's Scott. You come back to the same organization when there are 30 or 40 people, the answer you get is, that's the head of production. Her name is Diane. That's the chief operating officer. His name is Scott. We get roles once the organizations grow to a certain size. So figuring out the bridging, the bonding versus bridging capital thing, both in terms of software support and in terms of social organization is essential. And then there's the last one, which is the most famous one, uh, which is the, the, the tension between consensus and decisiveness. Participatory groups that start out tend to work by consensus, and consensus is an amazing tool because it means that everyone has what the Quakers call a sense of the meeting. A sense without having to be completely explicit about it that everyone understands what's going on and is facing in the same direction. Consensus, as we know over and over again, does not scale. Um, it, is, it is a great tragedy of the human condition because consensus-based groups are wonderful. And people commit to them, um, but they are defeated by exactly this. That density defeats scale, scale defeats scale. There was an amazing pair of documents from ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power from the 1980s in New York City, where this group comes together to fight the silence of the media and the, the greed of the pharmaceutical companies in the light of HIV and AIDS. And in a matter of 10 days, they create this incredible movement. And in the beginning, they're like, oh my god, consensus. This is the best thing ever. We all got in a room, and then we just went. And 10 days later, there's this document like, we have to start an executive committee. <laughs> because we're, we're, it's spinning out of control. And the executive committee works by consensus, and the committee has representation from other groups and so forth, but ultimately, and within less than two weeks, this group said, we are growing so fast that we've already blown past the peer consensus. Um, the difficulties various occupations have had with consensus versus not consensus is legendary. I won't rehash it here. But this is a permanent problem for participatory groups. And anything, whether it's social or it's based in software, that helps people get past that gap will be fantastic. Let me end with one, one observation about a mistake I think we should avoid making and now speaking especially to the people in the room dealing with data or programming for political movements. This is a story about the early days of the internet. It is not a story that is often told, often enough told in my view. So the internet was founded 45 years ago last month. But when it launched, it only had two programs. It only had two things it could do. The people who built it reasoned that computers were these fantastically expensive and valuable things. It would be great to give people remote access to computers, so we get telnet. And the reason, these are scientists and researchers, they are people who care about data, it would be great to give people remote access to data, so we get the file transfer protocol, FTP. And then, almost nothing happened. Almost no one, for years use those two programs unless they were researchers or programmers working on those programs. There wasn't a lot of third party, oh, I'm just a scientist and I want to run my batch job on someone else's computer stuff. There wasn't a lot of, oh, those files will be useful to me here. It wasn't until the early 70s when Roy Tomlinson ported email from MIT that the internet took off. Within 90 days of email's arrival, email accounted for 75% of the backbone traffic of the year. The most valuable thing connected to the network is not the machine and it's not the data, it's the user. We have a habit, whenever anything digital comes along, of overestimating the value of access to data and underestimating the value of access to each other. So whenever you see political support tools that are about aggregating information and arriving at the best decisions, 
there's a risk that those tools are overlooking the effect of decision making, not as a way of information processing, but as a way of legitimating a course of action for a group of people. And if you don't include that emotional piece, you are treating the people as if they are the machine. My friend Marion Manilow pointed this out to me about the Occupy movement and about these movements in general. A purely action-oriented movement can keep incredible pressure on its subject for up to a year, but then tends to peter out. The thing that keeps movements going the long term is does the movement give over a substantial amount of time and attention to taking care of each other? as a separate act from focusing on their political act. Especially in the United States, in, in the light of Occupy, it became clear that taking care of other people was itself a radical political act. And I think it is no accident in the aftermath of Occupy that the great successes are things like Strike Debt and Occupy Sandy, which are the places where caretaking and politics intersect rather than things like income inequality and the Tubin tax, which are places which are much more which are much more connected. So in the spirit of the unconference and of finding problems that we might all like to talk about and looking for ways to make progress, <coughs> I would say that one of the persistent issues we now know from participatory political movements, dated from roughly the Iranian uprising in 2009, is that short-term, large-scale action is incredibly available now. But the, the kind of long-term organization building and hashing out of mutual commitment is still weak. And that dealing with the ways in which density and scale interact, dealing with questions of modularity, dealing with the questions of, of consensus versus decision-making, uh, dealing with when you need bonding capital and when you need bridging capital are all still open questions. And I would say to everyone in the room, no matter what angle you come in at this, do not overlook the need for the members of anything, whether it's writing the software or, or occupying a government building, to have some commitment to take care of each other as well as some commitment to pursue the action if the movement is going to last. Thank you very much. Ayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayay
I guess some of the work that we're doing with Lumio is, is trying to teach people the skills of how to be an effective member of that group and, and how to how to recognize um, that you you are in a densely connected network and how to recognize uh, the needs of the whole and where to put your own needs in, in relationship to that. And um, I guess I wanted to put as a data point, you know, our, our uh, workers cooperative is now 16 members. So if someone could quickly do the maths and tell me, you know, <laughs> how many patients it is, and we're, I, I feel we're, we're functioning really, really effectively. Um, and it's because there's been a huge amount of effort put into developing the, the skills and behaviors of how do you operate. And, and of course, we've developed some modularity as well. Right. But primarily it is that, like we said, looking after each other and, and developing the skill of, of being an effective group participant, and instead of just being the egocentric. Right. My opinion is very important, and everyone must listen right, to Right, right, yes, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's my way or the highway. Um, yeah, the, the what, yeah, what certainly, this is as diagrammatic as it could possibly be, and what this doesn't say is culture is a tool of inflecting these groups. Modularity, in fact, is one strategy for saying, I trust that group to do the right thing while I'm doing this, um, this over here. But I think the question of culture is, I mean, I didn't touch on this, but a huge dilemma for us in the United States around these movements is dauntingly for anyone of a liberal political persuasion, it is more difficult to develop social capital in racially diverse groups. Um, that is about the worst news we could have gotten for the US political project, but enough data has come in suggesting that, that in, for example, neighborhoods that diversify, social capital goes down. Um, the message for us, I think, particularly for people working in or committed to multi-ethnic coalition, is that you have to do extra cultural work. You have to essentially commit to creating the kinds of situations that will, artificially, whatever that word might mean, increase social capital in the context of multi-ethnic groups. Um, the, uh, also dauntingly for liberals, the two groups that do best with racial integration in the United States are the military and sports teams, because they have a clear objective and they have an easily identifiable external opponent. So um, it, is, it is difficult for liberals to pick up those tools, but not impossible. Um, but picking up those tools is essentially one of the things we have to do. Um, I will also say of GitHub, it is absolutely part of the part of the, the, the wonder of GitHub that you you argue by participating, and I love the fact that they're called commits because there is a there is a way in which if you're not committing, I'm not interested, and that takes that 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 resonates at both at both the political and the and the level of the software. Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, argument on GitHub is not really just about commit, it's about issues. Uh, the difference between political issues versus software issues is to take testability and focus. Um, so, I mean, just to add on top of that, uh, what you're saying. Another thing is, uh, I'm sure the Iranian uprising is on 79 and not 2009. What's up? Iranian uprising. You say it's 2009 or 79? Yeah, no, I'm talking about the I'm talking about the June uprising with the Mousavi okay. election. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, also, uh, our multi-ethnic relation uh, in Malaysia, we have a dedicated group that focusing on that. It's a lot of work. I yeah, 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 yeah it's a lot of work. Yes, um, with the government environment right now, it's not easy. I appreciate what they do. It helps keep our group a bit more crazy. Right, just uh, just comment on that.我要用中文問耶可以好我用中文問不好意思我是雨晨安迪然後我這邊想問的問題是目前其實我們發現在台灣那個社會我們這邊的人大部分的人其實都會投入到我們資訊的工作當中我們會在距離一面做貢獻但
新闻报或报纸来得到他们的资讯，可是那些资讯是被操作过的。然后也有一些年轻的朋友，他们可能是我们的同学，可能是我们的同事，或者是我们的朋友。那他们其实他们也并不习惯于用这种方式来得到资讯，他们更习惯用 Facebook 那些被过滤过的呃资讯，或者是呃他们可能会花时间去关心。呃，就是什么小狗小猫的东西，或者是一些流行，但是他们不会想要花时间去读一些真正会改变他们想法的文章。所以有没有方法可以让他们了解到这些资讯的重要，并且让他们主动来使用我们所做出来的工具 ？Yes, excellent. Uh, so, uh, so much there um, to to say. First of all. People mostly don't change their minds. They mostly change their emotions, and their minds follow. Uh, many people had, I think, with Occupy, the experience I had, which is that I went down mentally saying, "I am a UN observer. I have a blue helmet," and it was it was the emotional connection to what, particularly for me, the food tent was doing, that brought me there. Uh, so. If you concentrate on the media as a source of information, you're playing in the wrong. You're, you're already playing in the end of the pool, most controlled by your opponents. You want to translate, or I know what to say. Yeah, I Uh,我们往往改变的其实并不是我们想法，而是我们的情绪。像他自己也是一样，他走进了呃，他是参加了当时的华尔街抗争，他想说，哦，我是个UN，我只是一个旁观者，我并没有参与这个抗争。但是他
people took the KFC logo, the Kentucky Fried Chicken logo, and put sunglasses on Colonel Sanders and made it say CGC instead of KFC. And because that was funny, and because images are harder to censor than words, so don't underestimate that ability. And then, oh. <laughs> <laughs> 他也支持这个理论然后他这样例如在中国大陆的话那像他举的例子是那时候有一个律师少官从他的对对对他会说去监狱然后当时候当时候他们就做出了一个透过利用肯德基的那个 and then the last thing is, if you are talking to people who don't agree with you, when you're talking about the middle, the, say the middle-aged group that is accustomed to getting their information from mainstream media, don't ask yourself, how can I get those people to believe everything I believe? Ask yourself, how can I get those people to believe anything I believe? Because the first step is really stopping seeing you as a crazy marginal figure. It's not about converting them to a complete separate worldview. It's about getting them to be willing to listen to you because you have said one sensible thing. Because if you say one thing where they think that makes sense, for Occupy it was whatever else people believe, income inequality, that makes sense. So look for, look for anything you can get those people to believe and work from there. 那至于你所提到的那些可能年纪稍微稍长那些人那些他们是透过主流媒体来得到他们的资讯呢不是透过像我们这种网络的方式的话他说我们的目标不是让他们相信所有我们想要表达的讯息这是比较不可能的我们应
is did the people in the disaster know each other before the earthquake, tsunami, tornado, hurricane, whatever? Um, it's not did the government respond well, it's not were there warning sirens in place. Those things are important, but the real vital characteristic is did people know each other and trust each other in a civic context? So any kind of participation is valuable for that. Uh 他们看到的是说，其实这这个重重建的情况跟跟政府的资源补助跟帮助其实没有太大的关系。他的他而是跟原本这个灾区里面的人，他们是是否认识彼此，是否相信彼此，然后他们对彼此的信任信任度跟
Thanks, Larry. Uh, wonderful. This is um, opening by uh, close opening by uh, another quote of place saying that the, the most important outcome from the hackathon, I think, also from the conference, is not the code we produce, but the social capital we build together. Right. So uh, with that, um, we will start like doing the posting.我們會試著把類似的主題放在一起放在同一個房間那我們剛剛不然其實不是說大家來做一個presentation 我們現在其實外面有點心可以邊吃邊但這一間不能吃東西所以 uh, uh, no food in this room so uh, please consume uh, stuff off that but we'll do the toasting here and then rearrange the, um, the rooms um, uh, 那這個, 這個排序其實大家都可以參加 所以大家可以幫忙看說這邊上面哪些主題類似的把它們放在一起 Okay, 好,那就 Let's go, 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 let